Uh, my story for you today, guys, is a story about information in nature and how I'm exploring this idea to better understand how watersheds respond to changes in the environment and how that can affect water availability and, and water quality. So I'm going to show you today some uh, snapshots of natural history that reveal how a particular mathematical theory can help us to identify uh, the importance or the timing or and the relevance of historical changes in watersheds. But before getting started, I want to acknowledge all, all the financial support uh, to uh, funding agencies. Many people have been, chase, uh, have been chasing in the in the offices, Catalina, Bogdan, um, people working in, in the labs uh, to put all this data together. I'm going to start with this, this number, 1.4 billion people. We have more than this number today, 2 billion people living in watersheds that suffer from water shortage. Why? Well, the causes of water scarcity are difficult to separate. Natural variability, climate change, and destructive land use practices has been interacting for a long time to affect water availability and water quality. So the problem of water scarcity is a problem of history. And that makes us to rethink the way in which we approach the problem, rethink about our questions. When I came here, I was facing a question like, what are or which are the effects of disturbances on discharge and sediment transport in a watershed? But what we have to take into account of these, all these historical developments that we saw today, some evidence in the three rings that Brian was presenting, for instance, we might be asking the question about what does these signals like discharge and sediment transport tell us? about the role of disturbances in watersheds. So that made me look into environmental records that can be developed by humans, like long-term history records of uh, in the A.J. Andrews historical time series of, of discharge, or even the sediment layers in lake bottoms in sediment cores to look for these changes. So I'm going to tell a, a couple of stories of, about that. However, to look into these records and asking that question about what they mean to us is asking about what information they bring to us. And that is about is a question that can fundamentally be answered from the perspective of a mathematical theory known as information theory. However, as soon as I said that, people start asking, well, what is information theory? And I've been trying to explain this to many people all in, the, in the last year and had struggling uh, with a lot of difficulties, you know, and perspectives and views and discussions. And uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a lot. However, I tried to put together a simple, short definition, uh, and that was for my last uh, meeting with my committee meeting, where you get all the people, the experts in your field, to explain what you're trying to do with your research. And, uh, and I came up with this. And uh, information theory is the mathematics of uncertainty. Well, I think I overestimate the impact of that kind of sentence uh, because it's still obscure. What is this uncer uncertainty and uh, what, what is going on about that? So I'm trying still to find a way to explain it. And uh, I found out that it goes to this shape. This shape that describes how we feel, how we experience uncertainty about or when changes are happening. We start getting familiar with stuff. At the beginning, it's a big surprise, and then we, we get familiar. And some people say that I'm obsessed with this curve that I'm seeing everywhere. But I can't help when you find papers in nature and uh, science telling how uh, particles collapse into waves or how proteins fold and follow exactly the same patterns. So the building blocks of the universe, the building blocks of the life, actually change in order or following this pattern to make the world look in the way it looks to us. So is it possible that we can find this same pattern in our ecosystems? So we don't need to understand quantum physics to, to see what is going on. We don't need to get into the deep details of, bi of molecular biology to get this. Somebody put this together some time ago for us to understand it more easily. And we can actually see that we can explain it with a very, very simple experience, like flipping a coin. We are too much obsessed about what is going to be the outcome. But when we are concerned about the outcome, we miss the interesting part when the coin is in the air. What is going on there? The uncertainty is highest. We don't know what is going to happen. So. Imagine that we want to describe these states using binary digits, like bits, zeros and ones. 
So we say like the, the heads are zeros and the, and the tails are, are ones. So the description is easy on both sides. But when we are in the air, the description is a little bit more complicated. It's less predictable. So this guy, Klaus Shannon, developed a measurement of how, how long can be this description, how complicated can be this description if I want to do that. And he decided to call it with a more interesting name, entropy. But at the very end, it's a name for the same thing. It's a name for uncertainty. It's a name for variability. It's a name for heterogeneity. So the question again, are our ecosystem behaving according to this rule? Actually, we have an idea about this. This is the idea of the uh, intermediate disturbance hypothesis about how ecosystems respond in terms of diversity to changes. But diversity is also an expression from nature about the uncertainty in the environment. So it's very intuitive. Imagine you have a, a forest plot. And then in that plot, you start with a really small disturbance, like this one on the corner. And still, the description is pretty easy. OK, it's a, mo a small disturbance, it's still forest, mainly. But when you get this, this medium size, uh, disturbance, it, you need to start explaining where is this plot, this plot located, what is the impact of this in the heterogeneity in the environment, until the disturbance is so big that it's, okay, it's totally disturbed. So now we know again. But that's another certain point. Now we know the forest was destroyed, if that's the case. And actually, it's interesting to see that we, we've been measuring diversity using Shannon's entropy which we know as the Shannon Diversity Index, but it's basically the same equation that people was using in the quantum physics example. So there is evidence that we might have this behavior in, in nature. So I'm going to start with two short stories about how can we represent these changes in ecosystems. I'm going to start with a story that com comes from um, the A.J. Andrews. And uh, in the A.J. Andrews, we had this experiment when we cut uh, uh, one watershed, and we were trying to compare the, respon uh, the response of this watershed with another one that we keep as a control. Uh, watershed 10 is, is the watershed that we're going to be looking as the log watershed. It was clear in 1975. And now we have this rich database to look through time what was going on in there. And we have watershed 9, which is uh, the control. So basically what I did, I did, uh, we have the data for this charge. This charge, you know, they, it behaves exactly in the same way that heartbeats show up in the, in the electrocardiograph. The texture of the signal tells you a lot about how this, inter this system is working internally. So basically what I did was take, taking each year of these signatures and calculating the complexity of this description. And these are the results. So, this is a mathematical result. This is not a statistics. So basically, we're feeding the data to the predictions of the information theory model. And this is what we see. So what we're seeing here is that uh, this value of entropy compared to how far this each year deviates from the average behavior. So the years that are actually on the top are the more variable. And, but we can see also that it's in these watersheds, uh, the distribution of the time is different. So basically what it's telling to me is that they are responding differently to the changes over time. But I got interested in the ones that are in the top when the coin is flipping in the air. What is going on there? Well, it turns out that these years are droughts. So how is it possible that during droughts you can have that amount of variability? How can this watershed be so uncertain during droughts? So in order to appreciate that, we have to look into the variability again, into the texture, not the magnitude of the values. So for that reason, I'm using this normalized discharge just to compare the textures. And you can clearly see that for both watersheds, there is still variability during droughts. There's still some rain that comes in, but not when it is suspected. So we're expecting the rain in the winter, and then it shows up a little bit late. So that creates a lot of uncertainty in the system. But we also saw, saw that there is a difference in the distribution of the dots in the line during droughts. So that means that watersheds are responding differently to droughts. So why? So I started just looking into the data that is available, and I found this. My analysis was suggesting that the critical moments were the summer recession, when the water is just leaving the watershed no impulse of precipitation. So this is more related to how the watersheds are storing the water. And what you can see here is that for watershed nine, which is the control watershed, 
we have a difference. It's really sensitive. So when watershed is uh, in watershed then when water is living in the summer, deviates, particularly in these drought years, deviates clearly from the average trend. Not so for watershed 10. It looks the same. So there is a mechanism maybe in the watershed nine that is more sensitive to, to what happening during droughts. What is that mechanism? I'm not still there. I'm trying to figure that out, and I think there's more people here that is trying to answer this, this, this kind of questions. But what I was trying to see here if, was whether or not this information theory results were making sense in terms of how these systems behave. And it seems that they are producing reasonable results. So I decided to go back in time a little bit more. And this is the other story, the Loon Lake case study. Loon Lake is, uh, is uh, located in southern Oregon, and we had access uh, to a well-preserved sediment core uh, of uh, summarizing 1,500 years of history. So basically, I did something similar. In this case, sediments store the information by using different combinations of grain sizes in the same way hard drives use different combinations of zeros and ones. Then I can apply the information theory to analyze this data and recognize the impact of different events. And these are the results. I was expecting, again, the curve, but I got these red dots all over the place. But first, what means these dots that are going all the, all the other side? Well, according to an independent record and to our calculations of C14 data, we tracked that event to an earthquake that happened around 1,500 years ago. On the top, we have the flood in 1996. But, but these red dots, I was curious, and so I was tracking them in time, and I found out that they correspond to the pre-earthquake condition. So I was, again, what is going on here? I was expecting to be all the events summarized in this same curve. But well, uh, sorry, and this uh, was also interesting. The signature for the 1996 flood was also represented in, this, in these red dots. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that these entropy curves can be also entropy spaces. The theory predicts that they can actually have three-dimensional shapes, and they, then you can locate the dots along this space. And uh, what, this, is, what the, this means is that basically there was a change in the rules of the game. So that is the curve that corresponds to the pre-earthquake. And after the earthquake, it seems that something, did, something changed in the, in, the, in the way the sediments are deposited in the lake. And now the lake that we have to, they behave according to the black one. But there are some memories from the past that shows up eventually, like the event in 1996. So we have a, some kind of legacies here from previous sediment regimes. So what does this chart and sediment transport tell us about the role of disturbances in watersheds? Well, this chart in the AG Andrews tells us a story about the difference in responses to disturbances between watersheds that we thought were comparable. What's going on in there? The, what, what happened with the trees? We were expecting something related to the trees, but now we have more evidence about the hydrological separation. The water that supplied trees is taking some different pathway to the water that goes into the streams. Maybe this is raising the question about the, uh, the control from deep soil structure, storage mechanisms. What happened in Loon Lake? Well, the sediment in Loon Lake are telling us a story about a game-changing event like the earthquake and the legacies that can show up at some point in the present. So these changes are probably reflecting a transition between two sedimentary regimes and some remnants emerging in more modern process, recent processes. So in this process of decoding natural history, trying to find all this information that is in these places in terms of sedimentary or water language, there's a lot more to do. But I have a fundamental question here. Why does it work? What is going on there? So I showed you that this pattern can be found from quantum physics now to ecosystems. Can be an underlying fundamental principle there. In summary, I told you that the specific site historical interactions complicate our understanding of ecosystem responses to disturbances. What I'm trying to do is to use an information theory model of history that identifies the timing and measures the relevance of these historical changes in watersheds. 
I think what with further improvement and with more refinement, we might be able to predict how this ecosystem responds to, to abrupt changes. And that would be guided by the better understanding of natural dynamics using information theory principles. But as I said, there's more fundamental question to answer. And this question is about information being the third fundamental quantity in the universe. That, I think, is going to be another amazing story that only time can tell. Thanks.